Jesus, Jesus has cleaned me up. Now, right by the dumpster, he cleaned me up. I'm not where I need to be, but I'm not where I was. Amen. What a great testimony of that woman. So let's welcome uh, into our midst Michael Feely. God bless you. Tom Hanks is running, and he gets shot. 
and, 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 and as the scene unfolds, as the, the shooting winds down, Tom is shot, and he's sitting against a wall. Amen? Amen. And as he's sitting against the wall, he's dying. And he calls Private Ryan to himself. And he holds him close. And he gives him an exhortation, an admonition. And he grows him close and he whispers in his ear, earn it. Live well. Are you with me? Amen. You see, because Private Ryan had been given mercy. He had been given a second chance to go home, unlike all the other men there. And so as, as Tom Hanks is dying, he says to him, you've been given a chance that the rest of these men and women do not have. So for the rest of your life, act like you deserve it. Earn it. And so in our text this morning, I want to talk to you about an intelligent response. God's mercy. I want to suggest to you this morning, just as Tom Hanks gave Private Ryan an admonition to live well, we have that same admonition from God's word today. To live well. Amen. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Paul says, listen, because of God's mercy, and I don't know about you, but I'm thankful this morning for God's mercy. Amen. Amen. None of us would be here today without God's mercy. And Paul has wrote 11 chapters about God's mercy. He has talked about how the heavens declare the glory of God and how Creation shows that there is an awesome God who created this universe. He talks about the fact that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the ungodly. It was God's mercy that saved you. And you and I must never forget that in and of ourselves, we have nothing righteous in us. There's nothing good about this flesh. When I compare myself to the righteousness of God, Isaiah said, your righteousness and my righteousness is as a filthy rag. The only reason that I have a ticket to heaven, a seat in the kingdom of God, is because of God's mercy. His righteousness has been imputed to you and I through receiving Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. It was his mercy. I'll tell you a quick story. I was raised in a Baptist church in Chicago, Illinois. Went to church for 18 years. Amen. Amen. Sang in the choir, sang Amazing Grace, sang somebody bigger than you and I. Didn't know Jesus from a hole in the wall. I was not saved. I had been dipped and tipped and baptized more times than you could ever think about. <laughs> Amen. I was a sinner hellbound on my way to hell. And I remember. When I look back at my life, man, it's, it's, it's all mercy. But I, I'm thankful that I had a mother that said, no matter what time you come in at night, Sunday morning, you're taking your behind to church. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. And I remember one night, I was at my friend's house. I was probably 19 years old. And we were sitting around a card table with what they call a, a bong. <laughs> some of y'all uh, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Amen. For those of you that don't know what a bong is, but a bong is a bowl. <laughs> with several hoses attached to it. And, and there were four of us. So the bowl had four hoses. And I was sitting here, and, and Durham McClinton was sitting here. And, and by the way, I grew up in a, a beautiful neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your neighborhood is. When sin enters in, it brings destruction. Amen. 
And we sat there over this bong of marijuana, cannabis, doobies, <laughs> blunts, whatever you want to call it today. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I remember the conversation like this. Everybody has a, has a hole, don't they? <laughs> and my, my best friend, Michael Liggins, he looks across to Durham McClinton, and this guy named Darnell, Michael and I, we're still going to church. Not saved. <laughs> and Darnell and Daryl don't go to church. So Michael looks across the girl and said, Girl, you know, you and Darnell, when y'all die, y'all going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> so we go back to. <laughs> And girl said, well, why, why are we going to hell? <laughs> because Mike and I, we go to church. Y'all don't go to church, so y'all going to hell. He looks at me, ain't that right, Mike? Your brother preaches, so you tell him. <laughs> and see, my oldest brother had went into the army and given his life to Christ. He got saved when he was in the army through the Plymouth Brethren. Amen. And I'll never forget the day he came home. He wrote us a letter, and I read this letter, and I sat in that Baptist church for 18 years and never heard the gospel. I heard about hell and heaven, but I never heard the gospel. And my brother wrote a letter home full of the gospel. And I thought, this is strange stuff. I've never heard this stuff. I told my mother, I said, Winfrey has, has gotten caught up in some cult. <laughs> Probably some of them bald heads. He won't see my dudes and they passing out flowers and then and stuff. Winfrey lost his mind. And he came home from the I'll never forget. The bill bell rang. And I ran and I opened the door and there he stood. It was like Moses coming out of the night. <laughs> and I'm serious. I mean, dude's face was glowing. And it had nothing to do with the moisturizer cream. <laughs> dude was glowing. <laughs> well, you have to remember, I grew up in the 70s. Big, huge afros. I know they're coming back. <laughs> Amen. But no matter what I do, and no matter how full of the Holy Ghost I get, I'll never get my afro back. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully when I get the glory, the Lord will give me one back. <laughs> and, if, you know, we want a big platform shoes. They are swinging bell bottoms, slice your ankles. Long, greedy coats with fur on the car. And there he stood in a regular pair of pants and a shirt. I couldn't believe it. And so he comes in the house. I'm thinking, man, this dude has changed. Something happened to this man. And he says, and I, I, I said, Winfrey, that's great that you got saved, but where are your party clothes at? He said, Michael, I've led you in sin long enough. I took all of my party clothes, I put them in a barrel, and I poured kerosene over them, I burnt them all up. I'm like, you did what? <laughs> dude, I could use them clothes. <laughs> But I looked at girl, I looked at my friend Michael as we were sitting across that car table still smoking out of this bong. And I said to him, I said, according to my brother, that's not true. All of us, if we die without Christ, we're going to hell. And you know what happened after that? <laughs> we went back to smoking. <laughs> now, you see, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying to you is that it was only God's mercy. That spared me. And I'm going to cut through March 30th, 1985. I was sitting in a station wagon with my oldest brother. It was 5 10 p.m. And my oldest brother, who's now saved several years, and, and God had been working on me. I mean, I, I, that when the hound of heaven is chasing you, man, he's, he chases you. I could go nowhere without some Christian running up on me, handing me a gospel track. Jesus loves you. And I'm dodging Christians everywhere I go, man. God is just hounding me. The hounds of heaven is chasing me down. And finally that day in that blue station wagon, March 30th, 1985, 10 minutes after 5, my brother looks at me and he says, Michael, when are you going to give your life to Christ? And I want to tell you something. I can't explain it except that, that God spoke to me. And I heard him say that if you don't give your life to me today, Right now, I'm going to leave you alone. And I 
fouled my ear. I gave my life to Christ. Lord, I am a sinner. And I cannot save myself. And I do deserve hell and death and everlasting punishment. But I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. I believe that you raised him from the dead. Father, forgive me for all of my sins. Bow down and give my life to you. In Jesus' name. And I opened my eyes and I looked at my brother. I said, now, is that it? (laughs) And I'm serious. He said, well, if you believe that, with all of your heart, it was true. And see, there was a witness. There was a witness from heaven. You see, I knew that this was real. And that night, I talked to the Lord for the second time. I talked to him that time in the sinner's prayer. But that night before I went to bed, I went into my bathroom and I closed the door. And it was like the bedroom, the, the bathroom ceiling just opened up. Are you with me? Mm-hmm. And I said, Lord, I've been living for the devil for 27 years. And I will live for you. So whatever you have to do, Lord, make me a great Christian. I don't want to be mediocre, because I was not a mediocre sinner. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 You see, when I, I, I believe in sinning, and when I'm, I'm, I'm going to sin, I'm going to sin, I'm going to sin for real. I'm not going to mess around with it. Amen. 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 And so, 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 so when I read this text, it seems logical to me that because of God's mercy, because while we were yet sinners and Christ died for you and I, the ungodly, you and I are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's logical. It's highly logical. It's an intelligent response. It makes sense that if Jesus Christ gave his life for me, the only intelligent reasonable response would be for you and I to give our lives completely to him and to not become not second step, not half step, but to come all the way, whatever it takes, to live for the glory of God. Your body is a living sacrifice. Now we can go into all the details, but suffice it to say that your body is not your own. You have been bought with a price. Not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the incorruptible, precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It costs something for God to save you. And my reasonable response is, Lord, here am I. Make me and shape me and mold me after your will while I am present, yielded, and still. It's reasonable. My life ought to be holy. I tell people all the time that you may call me Saint Neil. Amen. You see, because when I when I gave my life to Christ, God turned me into a saint. Now, positionally, all of us are saints. Amen. Amen. Now, you may look in the mirror and say, well, preacher, I got some issues with this saint and stuff because I may be a saint, but my life has not reflected anything saintly lately. Amen? Amen. But positionally, you and I are saints. What Paul is asking us to do is to live out our position. To live it out. To bring it into our our everyday experience. And so holiness must must mark my life. Now, we all know about the process of sanctification. You know, you're building under construction. And and every day as you, you stay on this side of eternity... God is shaping you and molding you. But but we ought to be able to look back on October of last year and say that here I am today, I'm better than I was last October. Amen. You see, the, the process of sanctification is taking place. And, and holiness is beginning to mark my life more and more and more. Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. This world, especially today, 
has changed Amen. right here in our own country. This world is trying to, to shape us, to mold us into its image. And the problem in Christianity, one of the problems, is that we are allowing the world to creep in and to mold how we think. We're allowing the world to actually tell us how to interpret Scripture. Are you with me now? Yes, sir. Paul says, do not be conformed. Do not allow this world to shape you and, and, and to mold you into his own image. About eight months ago, I invited a lady to my church. She's probably in her early 40s. And we talked for about a half hour. And at the end of the conversation, she says to me, she says, now, Pastor, I've got to tell you something. I'm gay. I wasn't sure. I was kind of iffy. You know. <laughs> I said, okay. She says, so does the invitation still stand? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because God loves her, does he not? Amen. Amen. She came to church for seven weeks in a row. We loved on her, welcomed her. You know, and she was having a good time every Sunday morning. You know, because we, we rocked the house in New Millennium, by the way. Amen. I don't believe in dead church. Amen. 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 Jesus, Jesus is alive. I need to act like it on Sunday morning. Amen. 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 So she was having a good time. And finally, the eighth week, she said to me after church, she said, Pastor, thinking about joining your church, but I need to talk to you first. So come on in the office. Her name is Abby. And Abby is a wonderful person. I really grew to like and care about Abby. And Abby had been molested as a little girl. Raped by a deacon in the church. Concluded that men were evil. I'm giving you a short counsel of how she ended up in that lifestyle. She says to me, she says, Pastor, I love your church. I want to be a part of this church. She said, I've been tweeting, or twittering, <laughs> amen, amen, Facebooking, <laughs> texting about this wonderful church and the music and the choir and the preaching, and I just I just love it. All my friends want to come. She said, Now, but Pastor, I gotta tell you something. All of my friends are gay. I said, okay. He says, well, they have one question before they come. And the question is, will they be accepted? I looked at her. I said, Abby, has, have you not been accepted the seven weeks you've been here? Has anybody said anything derogatory to you? Has anybody mistreated you? She says, no. I said, well, then you should have been able to tell them they would be accepted unless that's not the real question. I knew that was not the real question. So Abby, what's the real question? She says, well, they want to know, will you, will this church expect them to change because they're gay and they're staying that way? I said, well, you asked the right question, but you're asking the wrong person. She says, well, what do you mean? You're the pastor. I said, yeah, but let me help you with this. I said, I believe that the Bible teaches everybody should come as you are. Bring all your issues to the Lord. Whether it's adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, lying, stealing, cheating, income tax evasion, <laughs> fraud, whatever the case may be. God says, come to me as you are. Now, but Abby, let me tell you something. God will accept anybody as they are. But God loves us too much to leave us the way he found us. Amen. So my answer to you is that God expects any behavior that we bring to him when he saves us, if we claim to know Jesus, 
God expects any behavior that is contradictory to his word to be put on the altar of change. And the power of God living inside of you with his word applied to your life will bring about the necessary change. So the answer to your question that is that God expects change. She looks at me and she says, that disappoints me. I said, why? She said, because I really would thought that you were the pastor that could lead the LBGT community out of the wilderness. I'm thinking, is that a compliment? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, lead the LBGT community? We just want to come and worship. We want to stay the way we are. We just want to come and worship. And, and I've been telling people, I think I found a pastor that would just allow us to come and worship. I said, you can come. But I'm, I'm telling you right now that all sin, any kind of sinful behavior, God expects change. And I expect, New England will always expect what God expects. Amen. Amen. So you know what she did? Anybody that comes to this church, this is what he said, can see that this thing is going to explode. I can have 50 people here next Sunday. And she said, let me tell you something, Pastor. They got dollars. And I'm sitting over here broke as a doornail. <laughs> okay. You know, praying every Sunday for the offering. Lord, please bless this offering. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to move on and pray for something bigger than that. <laughs> God, it's not so big. So every Sunday we cry out to God for a good offering. And now, you know where my mind went? My mind went to Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus was in the wilderness. I said, now Satan is taking over this conversation. You see, because she said, Pastor, she said, I, t I tell you what, they got big bucks. In a year, we could build you a building. I'm like, okay, Satan, you need to get up out of my home. <laughs> you see, because now he's appealing to one of my witnesses where we are. See, we're struggling. He's appealing to me. And I said, Abby, I'm sorry, but my condition has changed. You see, the world is trying to get us to conform. I want to challenge you today. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not allow compassion to conform you to the world. We love people, but we do not conform to their way of thinking. Do not allow this world to creep in and to cause your mind to leave what God's word says. And the only way to avoid that, the only way for you not to not be conformed to this world, is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. Paul says, be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That there, there is a metamorphosis, that there's something that needs to take place from, from the inside out. And Paul says, God says, the only way you and I will avoid being conformed to the image of this world, shaped in its mold, is that we must be students of the scripture, students of the living word, and allow this word to transform us because when I expose myself to God's word, when I get deep into God's word, when I apply God's word, it is doing something to my mind. Amen. And see, I must be careful what I take through my eye gate because what I take through my eye gate Affects my mind. So as a man thinketh, so is he. Amen. And so I, 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 I must become a student of the word. I'm here to tell you right now that this word has transforming power. Amen. This Amen. word can change people. Right. Amen. Amen. This word has changed me. I am a walking, living, breathing witness because of the transforming power of God's word. It renews the mind. It reshapes the mind. And what happens sometimes is that we become neglectful of God's word. That's right. Unless I'm preparing for class. I don't need the word. And even sometimes as preachers, 
we get caught up in simply preparing for a sermon. We forget about our own devotional life and our own need to continue to be transformed by the power of God's word. I, I, I've been last year or so, I have been, been challenging my people to begin to pray God's word. You see, I'm not a name to claim it kind of guy. If that's the case, we'd all be rich. <laughs> Amen. I, I claim a million bucks tonight. <laughs> <laughs> claim it on my way home when I leave here. Amen. Amen. But, but I do believe that I can name and claim God's word. God is not a genie in the Bible now. Rub it three times and get what you want. <laughs> <laughs> but I can speak the very breath of God into my situation because this book is the very breath of God and therefore I can I can pray God's word into my situation into my life amen amen, amen. amen. faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God and sometimes I, I come to a place where I need to hear my own voice speaking God's word it, it, it does it, 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 it has an incredible impact on my thinking, when I begin to speak God's word aloud, sometimes you need to pray with your eyes open and pray God's word. Unless you memorize it from Genesis to Revelation, I need to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But well, you got a secret. We can make some money off of that. <laughs> <laughs> but the word, and what will happen? It will help you to prove. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? We spend way too much time. Oh, I just don't know what God's will for my life is tonight. I just don't know. What do you mean you don't know? <laughs> you, can't, you can't figure out your whole life. But I know what God's word says. You see? And if I'm just true to what God reveals to me in his word, then everything else will eventually fall into place. Right. It's like driving on a dark street at night. And the headlights, you can only see so far. Amen. GPS says go left. But when you go left, you see something else. And the further you go, you see something else. God's will for your life is like that. But I must be true to what God reveals to me in his word. God says my life is to be holy. God says, I'm to spend time in his word. I, I, I'm to be a man or woman of prayer. I am to love people. I am to not be ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God and the salvation for all those who believe. Romans 1.16. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's, that's God's will for my life. That I, that I live for him. And how that fleshes out will be determined as you keep moving in the way God is leading you. Amen. Then you will be able to prove that good and acceptable will of God for your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, in closing, some of you are probably too young to remember that sitcom called Family Matters. Woo! <laughs> Amen. You know the characters? Carl Winslow. Yeah. Eddie Winslow. Yep. Harriet. Yep. The lovely Laura. Yep. And the star of the show, Steve Urkel. And you know, Orko was a bumbling chuckle kid. Yep. Can I just tell the truth? Hey, Amen. Walked hey. around like this. Amen. <laughs> hey, did he not? Yeah. Hey, he and was always stumbling and fumbling, knocking something down, breaking tables, food everywhere, experiments going wrong. Every time you see Steve Urkel coming, you just want to run.
And so he took this cool elixir and poured it into this transformation chamber. Amen. Amen. And he stepped inside this transformation chamber. Did I do that? Big stupid glasses, goofy as all good get out, amen. And he and he pulled a little. Um, um, um. He went in like this and came out like this. What's happening there? <laughs> oh, yeah. He walked into the living room and he saw Laura and he stepped around her like this. Yeah, yeah. But you're fine, sir. <laughs> He, he went from he went from Steve Urkel to Stefan. <laughs> he was transformed. Are you with me? Amen. You see, I want to suggest to you that this Bible is a transformation chamber. Amen. Amen. Are you with me now? Amen. And if you step into this transformation chamber every day, you will go from a bumbling, fumbling, willfully constant sitting Christian to a man. A woman of God, and you'll be able to walk in any situation and say, Lord, God, Lord, and I say, and I'm gonna say, Lord, I didn't do that. Are you with me now? Amen. If you believe it, give God some glory in the house. Yeah. If you want to be saved, give God some glory in the house. If you believe that these words have power, the power to change life. Believe 